All right, why don't we get started? So thanks for joining. I'm Mark LaMonica. I look after the individual investor team from Morningstar here in Australia. We've got a packed house in the Morningstar webinar studio. We have both Emily and Shani today, which just shows the excitement over the topic of thematic ETFs, which we are going to talk about. But first, anything you hear is anything you hear today is general advice. Can't offer you personal advice because I don't know anything about you. Also, if you're over in New Zealand, get a copy of our FAP from our website, morningstar.com.au. And the New Zealand regulatory authorities would encourage you to speak to a financial advisor if you would like personal advice. So as I said, we're going to talk about thematic ETFs, but we're going to sort of slowly work our way into this thing. Talk conceptually, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit about the market. And then, yeah, we can talk about thematic ETFs. So I like this quote from Bill Miller. So people have done these things before know that I like this quote. So what we have to realize as investors is that we are investing in the future. So all of the value that comes out of any investment, so the underlying companies, as well as, of course, any ETFs or funds are rolled up into, all of the value is the future. All the information, of course, we have is the past. And so what we're trying to do as investors is we are trying to predict the future, essentially, right? So if you're an analyst analyzing a share, you are forecasting out cash flows. And that's how you're calculating the value of a share. So it's just something important to remember. We always pour over financial statements and everything that's happened in the past. And that is important because that's going to inform our view of the future. The only thing that actually matters is the future. The other thing that's important to remember is that prices, so whether that is the price of an individual share, and we can talk about how this relates to the market right now, but it's the price of an individual share or it's a market index, that represents the consensus view of the future, right? So we'll talk more about expectations, but just remember that. So if we looked at what has happened to the market this year, Obviously, investors have a very different perception of the future than they did in January. And that perception, of course, has been driven by things that have happened, right? Once again, when we talk about inflation, when we talk about interest rates, we don't know what's in the future. We don't know what the next inflation reading is going to be, but we are using the past and things that have occurred. And as we get more data points, we're adjusting that view of the future. But that's really what the market represents. So remember, at any minute during the day when the market's open and a share is trading, that price reflects the consensus view of the future. So next thing we need to talk about is narratives. So as humans, of course, we are drawn to narratives. So we like to use narratives to explain why certain things have happened in the past. When in reality, you know, existence is not linear, but we are trying to piece together all these random things that happen and affect our lives into a narrative. And of course, those narratives are what we use to convince people about what we want to have happen in the future, right? So we just saw a political campaign here. That is politics, right? It's parties creating narratives to explain why certain programs will craft society into the way that they want to see it. So narratives are really important to us. And these narratives and stories that we hear from other investors and from people marketing investment products influence us a lot. Oh, we skipped ahead. All right. So the reason that we have this saying, so this is an old investing saying, buy the rumor and sell the news. And this is a demonstration, of course, of how financial markets work. When I was just start getting started in investing, I didn't understand all of this yet. So I'd be very confused that when a company report earnings that seemingly were good and the stock would sell off, and we've got this sort of quote from Apple, right, that uh, got off of the website, Apple shares fall despite record quarterly profits. I couldn't figure out this part. If they have record quarter profits, why would the shares fall? Well, they sh fall, of course, because of expectations. So it doesn't actually matter how anything, and we'll talk about this a lot, how anything performs on an absolute basis, it matters how it performs relative to expectations. 
right? So it's an important concept in investing. And we saw this, if we go back to COVID, we saw this, right? There was obviously a lot of fear about the future as cases started ticking up, you know, back in February and March of 2020. But then once everybody became comfortable and, you know, things did not go, I think, as people planned, but once everybody became comfortable with COVID and thought that, okay, we will go and we will shut down at least portions of society for a while, and then we'll reemerge and stuff, we'll get back to normal. Once people got comfortable with that concept, the share market immediately turned around and went back up, right? So it's really that uncertainty about the future that caused that sell-off. And then before, obviously, any of the lockdowns ended, the share market already rallied because it was looking past that, right? Because the share market's always looking towards the future. So something to remember. Two other concepts, and then I promise we'll get into thematic ETFs. All right, valuation levels. And this is an important thing to understand. So because the price, when we talk about the price of a share, the price of the share really reflects the valuation level. How much are we going to pay for a certain amount of something, whether that's earnings, if we're looking like a price to earnings ratio. So those valuation levels reflect the expectations of the future, right? So what we're trying to do is connect all of this, that if prices reflect the consensus view of the future, then really we can boil it down to valuation levels are the consensus view of the future. So that means that high valuation levels represent high expectations. So we have expectations for a pretty rosy future. But the higher the valuation levels are and the higher the expectations are, of course, the more difficult it is to meet or exceed them. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about valuation levels and we're talking about the risk and return trade-off, that when you have these very, very high valuation levels, it is hard to meet those expectations. And the question is, are you getting compensated as an investor for the risk that it inherently is out there with anything happening in the future? All right, so use an example. I use this example all the time, so I apologize if, uh, if people have seen this before. So Jeremy Siegel, and Jeremy Siegel is a professor in the US that wrote a couple books that I really like, one of which is The Future for Investors. So when he's saying just what we were actually saying, right? The long-term return on a stock depends not on the actual growth of earnings, but the difference between expectations and what actually happened. So he went back and he did this study. So he went back and he went to 1925 to the end of 2003. So he wrote this book around 2005, I think. And he went back and he looked at US stocks and he looked at what company performed the best. He wanted to know what was the best performing share during that period of time. Now, if we look at that period of time between 1925 and 2003, a lot happened. So, you know, obviously there were huge innovations that came out, you know, the microchip, the computer, the internet, et cetera, you know, flights, uh, uh, certainly airplanes had got mass adopted, automobiles as well, all sorts of stuff happened during this period and all sorts of technological innovations. And before he did this exercise, and obviously we just have to trust what he says, he was trying to think, okay, you know, what would it be? Maybe IBM, right? You know, they're maybe not seen as an innovative company now, but they were really at the forefront of a lot of the technology changes that were happening. And maybe that was the best performing share. Um, and, you know, he thought it would be something sort of, you might not consider it tech, but something sort of futuristic that sort of represented that era of time. Well, it turned out to be Philip Morris. So Philip Morris is, of course, and it's been split up now, but Philip Morris at the time was a pure play tobacco company. So it was a tobacco company, um, global tobacco company. Now they split it into global and US and everything else, but Philip Morris was a tobacco company. Now, he was very surprised by this um, because, of course, like, you know, looking at cigarettes and I have uh, and I have this chart right here um, that's looking at cigarette sales per adult. So like in the U.S., for example, smoking peaked in the early 60s. So not only has the product 
sales, the overall sales decline. But also, if you look at what happened with smoking is, hey, during this period of time, everyone figured out that it caused cancer. And there were a lot of different things that came of that, right? So there's obviously government regulation, there were increased taxes, there were huge lawsuits, um, you know, the regulation around they can't market their products, right? So a lot of uh, a lot of things that you think would be very bad for business. Now, what ended up happening is as each one of those things occurred, right? And, you know, obviously it wasn't one day that somebody came out and declared that cigarettes cause cancer. There were studies and, you know, it took time for all this stuff to develop. All of that bad news, that sort of continual bad news, of course, kept expectations really low and kept valuations really low. Also, the benefit that Philip Morris and other cigarette companies got is they generated a lot of cash and there wasn't really anything to do with it, right? Like they couldn't go out and market their product. So they couldn't pour their money into marketing. Um, you know, there isn't a lot of them. There is now actually um, with vaping and everything else, but there wasn't a lot of innovation, right? Cigarettes, a cigarette, a cigarette. So what did they do? They gave all that money back to shareholders. So, you know, when he looked at this and over this period of time, and obviously assuming reinvested dividends, the cash generated by this company, the reinvestment at low valuation rates made it an incredible investment. So, and this is a little bit of a different time period. He wrote an, another book. Okay, so if you invested $1,000 in Philip Morris, that it would be worth a quarter billion dollars now. Right, so $1,000 in 1925, and that's with reinvested dividends. So yeah, just really, really interesting. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I actually got the numbers wrong. $1,000 would add up to a quarter billion dollars when he wrote the book. So when he looked at this period in 2003, if you look at it now, it would be approaching a billion dollars. Um, so, and even looking at sort of shorter term, so 1999, the dividend on a share of Philip Morris exceeded the stock's purchase price in 1980, right? So pretty incredible. And what this is, is not an advertisement for smoking, um, but what it is, is just thinking about as investors, what actually drives returns. And what it is, is it's really getting back to the basics and something we should think about now with what's happening in the market, getting back to the basics, looking at valuation levels, making sure you are adequately compensated for the price you are paying for a share and, you know, boring stuff like collecting and reinvesting dividends and the compounding effect of that. All right, so let's get to thematic ETFs. So thematic ETFs are, of course, very popular. Um, and basically what a thematic ETF is, is it is supposed to be a portfolio of shares that represent a certain theme. And so, you know, I've thrown a bunch of different things up here. And these are different things that we have, you know, heard. Um, so, of course, there's all of this talk about electric cars and batteries and decarbonization, green energy revolution. Um, there's all these different things that are priced into the market that are priced in around these different themes. And that's what these thematic ETFs are supposed to capture. And so there's all sorts of different examples. But really what it is, is it is a marketing ploy by an ETF company. So they are trying to sell products. They're trying to sell products to you. And they know that as humans, we are really attached to narratives and that narratives resonate with us. So they're creating narratives and creating these products to capitalize on us all gravitating towards narratives because we think that the share market is not where returns come from not low valuation, slow and steady, collecting dividends. We think that investing is about finding some, the next big thing, finding some theme that resonates and that then all of a sudden you become wildly rich. That's not actually what is successful. And it's not successful for a number of different reasons that a good story, of course, does not necessarily make a good investment. And it doesn't make a good investment for lots of reasons. But one really important reason is the valuation level. And when we think about thematic ETFs, we need to understand, and we've got 
something on some data on this a little bit later, we need to understand that, you know, a thematic ETF at the end of the day, once that narrative has resonated with enough people, once the marketing department of an ETF provider has captured that narrative, created or found some sort of index that matches that narrative and gone out to market with this, it is conventional wisdom, meaning it is priced into the market and probably a very rosy scenario is priced into the market. So that is one big problem. Oh, that's a good question. I'll get to your question, Jill. So thank you for that. Um, so that is one reason why thematic ETFs are dangerous to invest in, in my opinion. The other or other reasons are some of them don't necessarily represent what they actually say they are. Um, so if you go in and look at some of the underlying companies, that some of these themes are incredibly difficult to actually invest in. And, you know, an example is, you know, we looked at, um, you know, a lot of these, uh, we look at a lot of these sort of, you know, clean energy and battery technology ETFs. And you go in and look at the companies, and only a small portion of some of the company's revenue actually comes from, um, comes from batteries, for example. So be very careful and examine what's actually in there. And I think a lot of people don't do this. Look at those actual companies and see if they actually even represent that theme, even if it's already priced in. So we have a question from Jill, which is a good one that Shawnee sent over. I assume that's from Facebook. Instagram. Okay. Um, so thank you, Jill. So why doesn't Morningstar rate thematic ETFs and so many investors are investing in them? Listen, to be quite honest, I think we should. Um, you know, I think that I think that our our manager research team who does research and rates funds and ETFs, I think sort of their theory is we don't think you should invest in them, so we're not going to rate them. Um, you know, personally, I will say that I don't think that that logic makes a lot of sense. I think we should just give them crappy ratings, and that should tell people that we don't invest in them. But that's at least the logic behind it. That we don't think it's a worthwhile investment for people, and so we don't go out there and rate them. So thank you for the question, Jill. Um, the other reason, of course, that um, companies like thematic ETFs is because they charge higher fees. So what we're looking at here is, of course, this line, whatever color this is, I'm colorblind. That line represents thematic ETFs. Then we've got pure passive ETFs and we've got strategic beta ETFs. So you can see you're paying a lot more for them. And of course, you know, asset managers make money off of fees and you're paying so much for them that you're basically paying active management fees for these ETFs. And the interesting thing about this is so many investors and the way that these are marketed, right? They're marketed as passive, right? Because they're all following these indexes. Now the indexes are ridiculous, right? Like they are just these made up indexes. Um, it is not the 500 largest shares in the US, like the S&P 500, it's not the 200 largest companies in Australia, like the ASX 200, they're basically just made up indexes. And what they've done is they've gone back and like back tested these indexes, and they're these Frankenstein indexes. So they're sold as actually passive products. And they're sold to a, well, they're sold to investors who overwhelmingly think that active management isn't worth the price. So they're sold as passive investments, but they charge active management fees. And of course, that's why companies like them and they love coming up with more and more of them. And you know, one of the poster children for like poorly timed ETFs is of course, when we started to get into crypto. So almost every crypto ETF that came out. So the first one that came out was, of course, just looking at companies that supported the crypto ecosystem, right? Like all the companies that are now like going out of business. And that ETF literally from like the first day that that thing came out, it collapsed in price. And then, of course, we had all these other crypto ETFs come out just in time for crypto to collapse in price. So Think about sort of when, and there's lots of regulatory problems, right? There are lots of, I will say there was lots of regulatory problems of coming out with crypto ETFs. They would have been out way before if that wasn't an issue. Um, but just think about also that a lot of times these themes are starting to get played out as soon as, uh, as, soon as they become conventional wisdom and as soon as they are actually released by 
a company. All right, so a couple of facts. Obviously, I put a lot of effort into these slides. Um, but we went back and we looked at thematic ETFs are relatively new in Australia, but they're not in other places. And when we went back and we looked over a 15 year period, half of thematic funds globally have shuttered, right? They've been closed down. And only 22% have survived and outperformed the global equity benchmark. So they don't work. Like we have a long history of looking at this and why were all those thematic funds shut down? They're shut down because the performance was terrible because obviously investors chase performance. So when there's terrible performance, people sell and, uh, and there you have it, they shut down. So, um, you know, I think at the very least, if you are going to use thematic ETFs, um, you should use them very sparingly. Um, cause I, I hear about people, these people's portfolios a lot where it is just like thematic ETF after thematic ETF after thematic ETF. And they all sound great. Right. I, uh, I spoke at the ASA conference a couple of weeks ago and I don't know whether I should have said this or not. Cause like beta shares was one of the sponsors, but you know, it's one of those things where like you had speaker after speaker, get up on the stage and talk about climate change and, you know, I'm not arguing that climate change is not a thing and that we are not going to lower carbon emissions, but everybody had heard of it. Who has not heard that climate change is a thing? That is the future and a future that people think is very bright for companies that are supporting this is priced into the shares already. Um, so unless you know information that nobody else has, it really isn't a source of edge. Um, so we talk about informational edge and yeah, it's not a source of edge if everybody knows the same thing. And so think about that when you're starting to look at some of these themes and these narratives that come out. So Lisa says, what happens to investors' money if the ETF is shut down? Lisa, are you worried that all of your thematic ETFs are going to shut down soon? Um, you get your money back, right? Like if they decide to close an ETF, right? You are, there are actual assets in there. So if they decide on... June 30th to close an ETF, they'll sell the assets, you get your money back. So basically you'll get back the net asset value. And generally with ETFs, um, the price that it's trading for is very close to that net asset value. So you will get your money back. No more questions or comments about thematic ETFs. I mean, neither Emily or Shawnee looks like they have questions because Shawnee has heard me talk about thematic ETFs a lot. And Emily admitted today she doesn't listen to our podcast, but you guys should. Um, anyway, so I guess we'll have a nice short one today. Um, so, yeah, I would just be wary of thematic ETFs and think a lot about as we're starting to digest all of the stuff that's coming out around markets. Be very careful and think about what markets actually represent. Right. And that and what they represent, of course, is the consensus view. And we saw that last week. Right. So sort of the consensus view was that inflation had peaked in the US. Then of course, when that reading came out at the end of last week, that was higher than everyone expected and showed that it had not peaked, we had this huge sell-off in the market, right? So it wasn't the absolute numbers, that number versus expectations. Two more questions. Um, yeah, so Eric is saying slide eight shows a line for 194 passive ETFs. That seems a huge number of truly passive ETFs that don't include some form of thematic, some other form of selectivity of the index. Yeah, I can go back and look at the data. Um, so I got that from our manager research team. There's a chart in one of their reports. I can go back and actually see what fits in there. I will say, you know, there is this notion around thematic ETFs of like, what is a thematic ETF and what isn't? And there is a lot of gray area. Um, in them. So like, you know, you could argue that the NASDAQ 100 is a thematic ETF, right? The theme is technology. So I think when we start to look at sort of sectors versus a thematic ETF, there can be some gray area there. So it's a really good point, Eric. So I'll go back and look at that um, list. Uh, so the anonymous attendee, which is always our favorite attendee, says, I bought them because of the huge marketing by beta shares. And I really regret buying them. Would you suggest I dump them in this current market? Um, yeah. So listen, I, I will say that there's a lot of marketing behind these things. Um, beta shares, of course, have never met a thematic ETF that they don't love. Um, 
but uh but yeah um so i i think a lot of this marketing is uh the marketing is obviously narrative based it's narrative based and it's back test performance based and so all of this of course does not matter right so when we start looking at back test performance so yes if you figured out that climate change was going to be a huge driver and you invested in it 15 years ago when nobody else thought any of this stuff was going to happen or maybe longer than 15 years ago of course you did well so like if you can identify an emerging theme before anyone else knows about it or very few people know about it then it can be a great investment my point is that obviously when these things come out it's widely known if it wasn't widely known and accepted then they wouldn't create an etf so 20 years ago, if you created a climate change ETF and 85% of the population said that whole thing is BS and it's not going to happen, then they couldn't sell the ETF. So they wouldn't have created it, right? So yeah, I think that's a lot of the problem with the marketing. Um, so what I suggest you dump them in this current market, um, unfortunately, or fortunately for you, um, I can't make suggestions like that. Um, you know, what I think I would do is I'd go back and think about what you were trying to accomplish with your portfolio. So with all this stuff, like we have, we have this action bias, obviously, as humans. So when the market is gyrating a lot, and there's a lot of volatility, basically downward volatility, we feel like we need to do something. So before making a decision on selling the investments, I would start at the beginning, start with your goals, what you're trying to accomplish, what return you need to get in order to accomplish them. And then if you've gone through that structured process, figure out, okay, go look at that theme. Like, you know, what are the valuation levels now? What do you think the merits of that theme are? Why might it not work? Um, and then you can make a decision a little more structured to sell something or not. Like, I think, I think some of the bad advice that we get from people, I saw this thing the other day on, on social media from a pretty famous investor in Australia. And he, it was a man, was asked, um, you know, what should investors do now? And he said, oh, just ignore your portfolio and don't look at it. And like, it's like the most useless advice you can get because you know, you know that people are looking at it. You know that people are looking at the papers, whether they're looking at the portfolio or not. They're seeing the headlines about what's happening in the market. I think we need to acknowledge that people are actually out there looking at this stuff. But you know, channel that action. It doesn't mean you shouldn't sell things, right? Also, these blanket statements of don't ever sell anything um, aren't really helpful either. But now is the time to go back and relook at your goals and make sure that those investments reflect your goals. Um, that doesn't mean I'd necessarily sell everything and go to cash. That does not work. But think about those specific investments and if there are better investments for you. But don't chase performance and certainly don't chase short-term per performance. Um, so Mike says, if Morningstar does not review ETFs, can you please advise of a research org that does assess them? Honestly, I don't know. Who else provides, I'm looking over the peanut gallery, who else provides ETF research? Um, there aren't a lot of people. I know that I know that Rask has um, some ETF research, or maybe just lists of ETFs they like. Um, sorry. Oh well, we do. Yeah, we do cover ETFs. We don't cover these thematic ETFs. One thing that I will say about research into ETFs, and I, I was talking about this with somebody yesterday, and I think there is a misnomer. So, you know, what our analysts do when they're looking at an ETF, if they're looking at a passive ETF that they are rating, they are not saying it's going to go up or down. They are saying, is this ETF a good representation of what it's trying to do? Right. When they're evaluating an active manager, they are rating whether they think that active manager will beat their benchmark. But of course, if you are an S&P 500 ETF, well, you're not trying to beat the benchmark. So what they're saying, is that a good representation of those 500 shares? Will that reflect the changes in value in the benchmark? Right. It doesn't mean the benchmark can't go down. And so I think that's the other nuance um, as well. That's important. Oh, Vincent says, what's your opinion on how long this bear market is going to last? Um, well, thank you, Vincent. Um, okay, so I guess you asked my opinion. I'll give it, like, I'm, I'm not going to predict how long it's going to last. I'll just say, you know, what we've seen happen so far 
if you go back and look at what's happened, this has really been like a valuation driven drop, right? So when investors, so obviously central banks came out there all over the world, including sort of famously in Australia, came out and said that rates weren't going up for years. So people believe them. Obviously, when inflation started picking up and we started to see that change, everybody, once again, looking out in the future, not just the fact that interest rates have gone out, but looking out at expectations of future in interest rate increases that are already priced into the market, everyone said, okay, interest rates are going to be a lot higher than we thought they were. So when you told us that they weren't going up for years, we have this scenario. When you told us they are starting to go up and start raising them, now we have this scenario. So what that did is it created this sort of just change in valuation model. Because after all, when we're investors, we are, and we're evaluating investments, we have cash flows going out in the future, and we're discounting them back to the present. And that discount rate is impacted by interest rates. So that's what's happened so far. I think the worry, like my worry is that we were looking, if you look at like a PE ratio, right? So we brought the price down. So investors have collectively brought the price down. We need to worry about the E now, right? So the earnings. So my concern is, and I, I wrote an article about this that's getting edited right now. Um, my concern is around that earning side of things. So I think there's a lot of potential, and I don't know what's going to happen, obviously. Nobody does. There's a lot of things to be worried about with earnings. So number one, with earnings, if we look at over the past 10 years, we've had really strong earnings growth. But most of that earnings growth has come from margin expansion, right? So basically meaning that a company goes out and sells a good and service. So that's revenue. It's the price you pay for something. A simplistic example is Shani's got a Coke sitting on the table. Shani went out and paid something for that Coke. The margin, of course, says, okay, well, how much did it cost to market and, you know, um, market and create that coke and the bottle and everything else then what comes out the other side of course is earnings so we've had a lot of margin expansion in the past 10 years and it's come from a couple of different sources so one um you know certainly if we're talking about the us there are the trump tax cuts so trump corporate tax cuts um we've also seen sort of continuing positive effects from globalization so basically lower labor costs and we can go back and look at you know sort of who's had the power between corporations and labor for a while, it's been in the corporation standpoint, right? We've had breakdowns of unions um, and unions losing power. So whether you think that's good or bad, like it happens. Um, so we've had all these very positive things. We've had globalization where you can offshore and outsource things. Um, we've had, you know, incredible supply chain innovation so that you've had just-in-time manufacturing. So literally stuff shows up that goes into a car the day you're going to build the car means you don't have to keep it in inventory. All this stuff happened with globalization. So a couple of things, if we start looking at this stuff now, I don't think any government in the world is going to cut taxes and corporations right now, right? Governments are in a lot of debt with all this COVID stimulus. So that's not good. A lot of the globalization stuff is actually breaking down. So one of the things that COVID taught a lot of companies and I think a lot of governments is, okay, we need to be more self-sufficient. We need to bring more, uh, we need to actually onshore things, right? So that we're more self-sufficient. Um, so we saw this around the scramble early in COVID about how to get masks. And everyone said, well, oh, look, China makes all the masks and they want them. Um, so we've seen a lot of this, right? This sort of more like economic nationalism. So we've seen that stuff happen. We have seen the Trump China and now China and everyone else trade war um, and some of the rhetoric that's heated up there. There's, of course, a real war going on. Um, and, you know, if you're sitting in Europe right now, you're not feeling real good about uh, about how you're going to heat your homes over the winter. So there's been all of these things that happen. They're that actually unwinding all that globalization. And of course, you've got inflation. So I think you've got all these things. and It's very difficult to manage a company in an inflationary environment. Right. All the stuff that you could do very predictably about buying things and knowing input costs and then the prices you're going to sell stuff for, all that becomes really difficult for even the companies that are managed through that. It's a lot more challenging as management. So basically, at the end of the day, I don't see how margins keep expanding. They're at like double what they have been historically, if we go back and look at look at the trend. And so I'm personally pretty worried about earnings. And I think it'll be interesting to see, we've already had a couple companies come out in the US with profit 
um, warnings, including Microsoft, right? Everybody's favorite company. And so I think in July, we'll start to get second quarter US earnings. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. So, you know, I think my worry would be that if we start seeing earnings going down, I think the market's going to go down another level. And then my other worry, of course, is that central banks are not exactly good. And it is an economy, you know, it's like, turning an aircraft carrier or stopping an aircraft carrier, right? It's very difficult to do. Central banks notoriously miss the mark. And so the question, what everyone's worried about, of course, is will central banks um, throw global economies into recession, right? And particularly if you talk about Australia, the Australian market has done better. The Australian market's very cyclical, right? So it's made up of banks and miners. So there's a lot of cyclicality in the Australian market. And so I'd be worried about how it react to a recession. So that's my very long winded way of saying, I think it's going to last a ways longer. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I don't know if that counted as a rant, Shani, but you know, Shani said she wasn't listening, so that's nice. Um, all right, so how often does Morningstar rate ETFs? I've seen some of the ETFs, IVV, et cetera, five star for a long time. Is that still correct? Um, yeah, okay. So how often do we rate ETFs? So one thing I would say is our, our rating on ETFs, it's a metalist rating, so gold, silver, bronze, um, neutral, and then negative. Uh, so what we do for funds and ETFs, we look at them once a year, or we look at them if something major changes. So like for an active ETF, something major changing would be the manager changes, right? So the manager leaves. Um, so like, you know, an example of that is actually Magellan. So we re-rated all the funds and the ETFs that reflect those funds when Hamish left um, and moved them down to bronze. Um, so moved them down to peg. So yeah, it happens at least once a year, but also when something major happens, but honestly, nothing major really happens generally with a passive ETF that would cause us to re-rate it. Um, okay, so anonymous attendee, I bought these ETFs because of their yield. I now find that the yield is not what was advertised, but I attended this webinar about thematic ETFs. So I was wondering why this is not evaluated. I need to look at these ETFs closely and recheck my goals. Okay, so yeah, one thing I would say about ETFs um, in general is you know you do need to worry about distribution. So remember, with an ETF, you are not getting a dividend; you are getting a distribution. And the difference between the two may sound like semantics, but it's a distribution because it's not just income generated by the underlying shares in it; it's also capital gains. So those are pass-through entities that have to pass through to you, the owner of the ETF, any capital gains that are generated and any dividends. So what this causes is a distortion sometimes of that distribution. So the perfect example of this is the thematic ETF FANG. So right, FANG has 10 shares in it. I don't even remember what their stupid marketing is. There's 10 shares are supposed to represent the, you know, new economy or something like that. So they have 10 shares, it is rebalanced quarterly. So what that means is that every quarter, they bring it back into line. So you know, if one share did really well and it makes up 30% of the index, they bring it back down to 10%. So naturally what you're doing in a market that's going up is you are selling winners. And when you're selling winners that have gone up, you're generating capital gain and you're passing it on to the investors. So Fang declared this huge distribution last year. And a lot of people, and I saw a lot of people talking about this online, a lot of people were like, wow, this is amazing. Like, you know, we got this huge distribution, like, and they all call it dividends, right? We got this huge dividend, that's awesome. But if you go look at the shares that are in the index, nine out of 10 don't pay a dividend. And the one that does pay the dividend is a very small dividend. So this was not income. This was capital gains. So if it goes down, if the market goes down, you're not gonna get any of those capital gains. So you're not gonna get a distribution. So you do have to be careful about investing in ETFs for income because they are lumpy and they bounce around a lot and can change significantly based on market conditions. Because you know, you're not gonna get those huge capital gain distributions when the market's going down, whether you want them or not. And so it's just not income. So it's something to worry about. It's why people like licks so much. So Licks, on the other hand, are a actual company, right? Listed investment company. And so the manager has discretion about when they distribute income 
in capital gains. And the managers know that especially a lot of retirees like these products and a lot of retirees, of course, that are living off of their accounts really want to have a smooth income stream, hopefully growing, but they don't want a lot of volatility in that income because they're actually using it to pay for their life. So the lick managers know that and during good times, they will reserve those that income and capital gains, and then they can pay it out later on. And so we saw, especially around COVID, where there were huge drops in distributions as companies were trying to save money, they weren't paying dividends or they're suspending dividends or cutting dividends. A lot of the licks actually, from an income perspective, were a lot smoother than their counterparts in the fund and ETF world. Um, Wow, Lisa, this is this is quite a question. How does the modern algorithmically driven shift in daily market volume affect the validity of pricing the future into a market? Wow, Lisa, uh, <laughs> I'm not actually sure what you're asking. Um, yeah, I'm gonna need someone to explain most of those words for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the only, I, I think what you're potentially talking about is that a lot of trading and more and more trading is being driven by algorithms. So it is basically machines doing the trading. Um, and yeah, how would that how would that affect pricing the future in the market? Well, you know, listen, at the end of the day, um, you know, I think we still have to we still have to assume that there are people out there making decisions based on the future of the market, right? And a lot of these algorithms that are driving that are driving um, trading are are basically trying to do the same thing, right? They're looking a lot of these around factors, and they're looking at factors that have been able to predict returns in the past, and then applying them to the future as data changes and as different companies fluctuate in value. I think that's what you're asking, um, but we'll see. There's a couple. There's going to be a couple interesting things about what's happening in the market. Um, you know, the market is very different than it was the last time. And I'm not counting the COVID, you know, three week bear market. Um, there are a lot of things that are very different about the market. I think the biggest difference in the market from, um, from the last real um, bear market, which was back in the GFC, is the amount of money in passive. Um, and it's something that I think will be interesting to look at that, you know, over 50% of U.S. shares is held in passive funds or ETFs. It's passively invested. I think it'll just be interesting to see, you know, when that stuff. And if you looked at what happened, what's been happening with the market, that we've had sort of sell offs in a lot of large cap technology shares. And that's driven the market down because they make up so much of that. Um, those indexes, we'll see what happens with passive. Um, all right, so we've got a question. Can you give examples of non-thematic ETFs? Um, sure, yeah, anything that tracks a wide index. Um, so like an example in Australia is everyone's favorite, Vanguard Australian shares, right? Ticker symbol VAS. Um, that is a non-thematic ETF, right? It is following an index that is not designed to pick up on a theme. It's designed simply to say, these are the you know biggest companies in Australia. Um, so that's an example of a non-thematic. So, you know, if I'm investing personally, um, and Morningstar also recommends this too, if you're investing in passive investments, um, you know, look at wide representative indexes. Um, and there's arguments about all this stuff, right? A lot of the U.S. is made up of technology now because technology has done well, but, you know, that's still an index. That's what we track. Um, same thing in Australia, lots of banking and mining, but still it's a wide index. It's a representative index of the companies in Australia, which are, you know, in terms of the biggest ones, miners and banks. Um, so those are examples of non-thematic ETFs. All right, well, that's good that we got a little bit of a surge of questions. Oh. Um, let me check and see. We just got one more. Um, so you're testing me on ticker symbols here. So I will just quickly look this up. Uh, sorry, one second. We have we have dead air, Shani. Maybe you should come over here and say something. Um, okay, so yeah, looking at, so we have a question about the Vanguard Australian high yield ETF. 
Um, I personally would not consider that a theme. Um, you know, I, I think that there are probably people that would argue with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there is a difference between factor investing. So basically looking at a specific factor um, and taking shares from an index versus a theme like robotics. Those are two very different things, right? Like I wouldn't consider a S&P 500 value ETF and an S&P 500 growth ETF. I wouldn't consider those themes, right? We are simply sitting there and saying that, you know, we're not picking companies. We're not picking companies for any attributes other than are they a value share or growth share. And same thing with this Vanguard product. So, um, you know, I will say that I'm not that familiar with the selection criteria, but yeah. Our analysts seem to like it. It has a bronze rating. Um, ticker symbol VHY is what we're looking at. Um, so yeah, I would not consider that a thematic ETF. I would go in there and say, okay, if you were trying to, if the goal of what you're trying to accomplish here is to generate income, which is a real investor goal that, uh, that people have, go in there and evaluate it on that merits. Do you think it's going to generate income? Versus sitting around and saying, um, yeah, I think robotics is going to be the next huge thing. So I'm going to go find something that represents that theme. Like you are not investing. Your goal as an investor is to generate income. Your goal as an investor is not to get exposure to robotics, right? If you're going out there and you're buying these thematic ETFs, like let's be serious, and this is fine, but your goal is to beat the market, right? That's why you're buying these. And what I'm saying is that I don't think you're going to beat the market. So I think that's the thing with thematic ETFs is that I don't think that they will accomplish people's goal. I think what you're going to do is you're going to fund higher fees. You're going to pay higher fees, which also doesn't help you beat the market. And you're going to go into a theme where I think a lot of the futures are already priced in there. So yeah, that's sort of my closing rant about, uh, about, uh, thematic ETFs. Okay, we have a question. What is the difference between index funds and ETFs? Well, okay, so let's let's take a step back here. At the end of the day, right? So let's say you have an S and P five hundred index fund and an S and P five hundred index ETF. There is no difference between the underlying investments that are in there. So you're getting exposure to the exact same thing. So then, instead, what we need to do is we need to evaluate the merits of the two individual offerings, and we have to evaluate the merits of the vehicle, which has those 500 shares sitting in them, right? So what you're really getting with an ETF is you're getting the ability to trade it in a day, right? So that's what you're getting out of the ETF um, versus a fund where it is more difficult to invest, more difficult just in terms of um, the process, and it takes a little longer to get your money back, right? Because they are, of course, don't trade during the day. You have to wait until a closing price. So that's really what you're getting out of an ETF. You're getting more liquidity. Now, you have to go evaluate the other merits, right? There could be differences in the minimums in both of them. So generally, funds have higher minimums than ETFs. So if you don't have enough money to meet the minimum, that could exclude you. Um, as I said, pricing could be different. Um, so there's all sorts of things you need to look at um, other than that, but really all you're getting from an ETF that you're not getting from a fund is liquidity. And sort of what I would say, and Shawnee loves funds, um, but what I would say is like, how valuable is that liquidity? Like how valuable is it really to you? Because the problem, of course, with ETFs is you can trade them all the time. So people do trade them all the time. And that's sort of the John Bogle. So the founder of Vanguard who hated ETFs, that was his problem. He said that investors trade too much so creating a product that allows them to trade more is not a good thing. Um, so simplistic, but he was trying to look out at investor best interest, knowing that over trading is for most people a bad thing that, uh, that doesn't, get you to, uh, doesn't get you where you want to be to meet your goals. Um, okay, the anonymous attendee is shutting <laughs> his or herself off from all the marketing blurbs from beta shares and ETF securities. <laughs> yeah. Every time. So it's funny, Shani and I, it wasn't this year at the ASA conference. It was last year. 
that this guy, Phil Muscatello, who has this podcast, came around and was interviewing different people there and wanted us to talk about thematic ETFs. And we were actually next to the beta shares booth. And so we're sitting there trashing thematic ETFs while they're handing out this literature in the, uh, the next booth, which I think was, uh, was very funny. Uh, all right, we've got another ticker symbol. I think I know what this one is, but I will double check. All right, so ESG, so really good one. So we had we had a question about ESG, specifically IWLD. Would I consider an ESG ETF a thematic ETF? That's a hard one. Um, listen, there are a lot of things about an ESG ETF that do, do, that does seem like a thematic ETF. But what I would say is they are generally a lot wider focused than a uh, than a thematic ETF, as in they are excluding certain things, but they are not looking at this narrow niche of the market. Um, you know, I think the thing, I think what I would, there are two, there are two things I think are interesting about ESG investing, right? So like part of it is obviously investing your values, but all of us have different values. And, you know, I think that ESG investing will be replaced by basically customizable indexes, right? So we sort of sit there and we say, okay, ESG is an important thing because I want to invest my values. And then you decide that BlackRock gets to pick what's important to you and not, right? So, you know, a lot of people will sit there and say that they won't invest in alcohol stocks. And that's fine. Like, and if that's what they want to do, that is fine. Personally, I do invest in alcohol stocks. It is legal. I drink. I mean, who am I to not invest in alcohol shares? We had this debate around defense companies, right? You had a bunch of institutional investors debating defense companies. Like, we didn't invest in uh, defense companies because they build weapons up. Oh, but now Russia attacked the Ukraine. So weapons are good if the Ukrainians have them. So maybe we should put it back in. Like, I don't know. You get to make up your own mind. Same thing with this stuff with Tesla, right? So, you know, this Tesla got pulled out of ESG indexes and because they're saying Tesla does not meet criteria. Now, I don't know what your opinion is um, and I don't really have one, but, you know, Elon Musk disagreed with that a lot saying, I'm building cars that are good for the environment. And they're saying, well, you're still building cars, which isn't good, the process of building the cars to the environment. And you've got a bunch of issues and accusations of racism at your plants. And you've got actually, you know, fines that are coming in from the Environmental Protection Agency in the US because you're not disclosing how much carbon you're created. So yeah, it's it, we get all these debates, but it's like very academic. It should be about you. That's my ESG rant. All right. Um, yeah, so Joel's asking, are value and dividend ETFs seen as thematic ETFs? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I once again don't think so. I would not, I would not consider them that. Um, once again, the same thing that, you know, that is, um, you know, when we're talking about and we're talking about different characteristics of shares, those can go into your investment goals. So it's sort of that same answer that I gave before. So why would I want to invest in value shares? Well, you know, for one thing, I'd probably get lower volatility. So if that's something I'm looking at from a portfolio perspective, just like a quality, um, just like a quality index, if I'm looking for higher quality shares that would lower volatility, that's a real investment objective of mine, right? Like as you approach retirement and at other reasons, at other times in your life, depending upon sort of what your goals are, you want to lower the volatility of your portfolio, and that can be investing in certain shares, including dividend paying shares and potentially value quality factors like that, that will reduce volatility. So yeah, I wouldn't consider them thematic ETFs. All right. I think we're done. So we've got five minutes so that I can get my Coke. And then Shani and I, and Emily too, right? You're coming to this meeting, our meeting with the equity mates, which is exciting. Um, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, thank you guys very much for joining. If anyone has any questions, you can send them to mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com.
Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.